Welcome to the weekly roundup, March 24th, 2023. I'm Scott. This is Ben. Hello. As everyone knows. Uh, let's just jump right into it, Ben. Another another crazy week behind us. Hey, not only yeah. is it tax season, so we're yes. buried up to here and uh, you know, getting people's tax, tax. documents, etc. Right? Yes. Yes. The uh, financial world decided to turn on its head yet again. It's- it did. It did. Another week of um, financial crisis. Calling this, uh, <laughs> some people are calling it GFC two, Great Financial Crisis two. Early yeah. days though. Early days though. Yeah. But uh, as I look at the bank screen over here, we see um, regional banks at a new fifty-two week low today. Bank of America, PNC, BMO, TD, Wells Fargo. Uh, all hit 52 week lows today. Um, on top of, of course, uh, Deutsche Bank, which we probably, I think I noted in the daily today that uh, they're, they're under some pressure as well. They were down kind of, I think 13% at the open. They've, they've trundled around. We had Janet Yellen out today again, calling an emergency bank meeting. Um, so yeah, lots, uh, lots happening in the financial world. This week, and we have the Federal yes. Reserve this week too. Yes. However, one of the headlines says Deutsche Bank is not the next Credit Suisse, and I'll Amazing. say as panic spreads. What do you think about that? I think uh, this ridiculous headlines. <laughs> <laughs> <It could be. laughs> I, you know, obviously we talk about Jim Cramer on occasion. Um, but if we zip back about nine months, Jim Cramer said almost the exact same thing about uh, Credit Suisse. Great bank, great franchise. They're going to do great things. He pretty much said the same thing about Deutsche today on CNBC. So let's kind of kind of put your spidey senses out there. Um, but you know, well, look, yeah, they, that's, they, that's they, where I'm reading it from. So you got me. <laughs> so yeah, I think that. They have a derivative exposure, you know, the, their kind of their credit default swaps, like their, their kind of default risk has risen dramatically. So the only people that trade in uh, CDS land are institutional investors. Um, not you and me, not anybody we know. It's all big institutional money saying we're scared about a potential default in this bank. And so, you know, I, I guess we'll see, but I think it's mostly a derivative exposure because they have uh, one of the biggest books in the world uh, from that point of view. And that would be hedging Citigroup, JP Morgan, Bank of America. Like those are the U.S. banks would have exposure with Deutsche. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's it's a risk at this point that we got to continue to pay attention to. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, and what do you what do you do in portfolios in this climate? You just sit and wait, uh, just bite your nails. What do you do? Not a nail biter, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, if we uh, I think we, we zip back about three weeks, I said, you know, going into that weekend, the first like uh, when when Silicon Valley went and then Signature went, kind of leading up to that Thursday, Friday, I said, you know, I think there's something going on <laughs> here that is going to take a little bit longer than we expect. It feels a lot like 2008. Um, I think. You know, kind of coming into this, uh, we had for clients, we had exposure to bonds and duration and some of these things have done well through here. Um, and uh, if what's happening right now is going to speed up the recession that we thought was coming, then, you know, portfolios are doing pretty well through all this. So bonds, gold, US dollars, all those things are going up with this backdrop. And so from a positioning perspective, you know, I, I certainly didn't think that this would happen uh, like this, but the tightening financial conditions at the speed that they did were the, the reason for why something like this is happening. And so from a positioning perspective, it's wait, watch. Um, and uh, at some point here, I think we're going to get a really good opportunity to make some adjustments um, and take advantage of uh, things a lot lower um, than where they are right now. So. Yeah, lots uh, to pay attention to. Not a lot of changes with position for something like this. And so 
uh, portfolios are doing well. And so we're sitting tight, waiting and watching for, for what we do from here. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, how many slides you got for us today? Are you ready to jump to that or something you wanted to touch on before you get to the slides? No, nah, I think that's good. We can go into this okay. and then I'll wrap, wrap with a couple things. Nice. Get the slides up. Maybe yell at the dogs while you're... Okay. Can you hear the dogs today? Yeah, it's not too bad. You can hear them rustling around in the back. Not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, Denver was jumping around, it's excited. I, I can tell the, you're getting the shifty eyes going. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if I put this one up. I've done a number of presentations the last couple, the last week and a half or so. Just, you know, I have lots of people talking about Canadian real estate market. And so this was, uh, as you know, National Bank holds the uh, rights to the real estate index in Canada. And so we put out pretty good reports and uh, updates on what's happening in housing. And so, you know, lots to pay attention to, certainly from a commercial real estate perspective. And it, lots is written about that, but this is really focused on residential. And so if we look at the report here, like this is since uh, 2000. So 2000 to where we are today. Obviously, we've had a couple of recessions, which are the gray bars here and, and here. And then if we zip back to, to 2008 um, and, you know, most people remember 2008 as what happened in the United States and their housing market, things like that. But the correction we got across Canada was just under 10 at that time. And so, you know, 9.2 versus what we've seen so far this year, which is an aggregate number of about 11% down. And so continue to have these questions about, is there a concern slash risk in the Canadian uh, banking industry? And, you know, like, I think the verdict's out. I have lots of conversations and discussions with uh, banking analysts and investors, kind of give them an idea of what the mortgage books look, look like for the banks. You know, lots of them have taken aside money for potential risks and defaults. So, you know, this is a material number that we need to continue to pay attention to. Obviously, we're coming off of super extreme high levels. Um, and uh, Ottawa GAT knows about minus 14% for those uh, wondering. Um, but this is a number that we need to continue to pay attention to. And so we saw the Bank of Canada go on pause earlier um, this year. And so I think that's reflective now in this kind of correction and how long we see at these levels are going to play a pretty material impact for, for what happens to this number. So we continue to watch it pretty closely. So I think I put this out in the daily today, but did just want to touch on it again because we continue to have these, I uh, continue to have these questions and thinking about what's going to happen with rates. And this is the US Central Bank. And so they have a reasonable amount of data you can look at to say what's happened historically. This is effectively the last 24, 25 years of interest rates in the US. Canada's looks almost identical. Um, so this is what we saw coming into the, uh, the 2000s. We saw rates kind of peak up, peak as NASDAQ started to correct. And then we had, uh, of course, an elevator shaft down, uh, try to step, step, step back up rates into 2006, 2007. The housing market corrected, and then we went straight effectively to zero for an extremely long period of time while Bernanke was in the chair. And then we see rates starting to come back up in Powell's first tenure as we got into December of, uh, of 2018. So a massive correction in equity markets, about 25% in December. We were on pause very briefly, and then again, back down, slam back down to zero through COVID. So now that we've ramped up to this level, you know, I get these questions, is it going to be a nice smooth transition? And I think that's what central banks are hoping for. But historically, we've never seen it. Um, so maybe this time's different, but uh, I think it's very important to think about what, what and where we are right now. So just as we talk about the banking sector and what's kind of transpired, and so we've seen, and I've talked a little bit about how the banks have, you know, they have their cash reserves and they have them in these hold to maturity assets. And these are government bonds on one side of their balance sheet. And so in order to meet cash calls for people taking money out, they shift and sell things here and put them over here. But one of the challenges that uh, the banks have had with, with, uh, with cash in, the, in their deposit accounts, you know, we've seen a big change here. And so if we look at this uh, orange line here, these are bank deposits. This is on the left-hand side here, bank deposits. 
and we've seen them come down and deposits have been going down as rates have been going up. And so our blue line here, this is the amount of money in money market funds, high savings, this is US data. So if we look at it over here, as rates are kind of close to zero-ish, people don't really have the, the need or worry to move money out of their savings accounts or cash accounts into um, the, uh, the higher savings. But as we started to cross over last year, rates started to pick up. Now we've seen a massive amount of money flowing into money market funds and high savings and GICs and such like that. So you, know, you get a, a double whammy for the banks is that they're having to sell assets over here to raise cash and they're losing deposits at the same time. And so you're seeing the, the kind of the structure of the banking system get a little bit uh, diluted with, with rates moving up like they have. And so this will be an important number to watch right now. And if we look at what this means and where that money's coming from, the media kind of says, it's just the small banks where this is happening. It's not the case. It's actually come, majority is coming out of the bigger banks. So we'll continue to watch this as I think it'll play a major role going forward. This was an event to you know, do quick with two more quick ones. And this happened last night. And so when we think about um, the US dollar, and the US dollar is probably a major funder of all things in the world. They're about 80%, 85% of all flow that happens on a daily basis. And so, you know, most of the major countries in the world, you know, uh, UK, most of the European countries, Canada, um, they all have these swap lines where they can trade back and forth with the central bank in the US. It doesn't have any impact. But outside of that, there's these other um, lenders that, uh, you know, when the, in times of panic, they need to go directly to the central bank and, and ask for kind of a short term loan. And what we saw last night was a huge spike, a $60 billion request um, come out of uh, somewhere been reading and following where that potentially come from. Some say it was Turkey, but generally it looks like it appears this was a, a loan directly to China um, for them to uh, to get some, so they were short on US dollars to get some short-term cash uh, for some of their funding needs. So, you know, well, again, this isn't, uh, it, it is quite surprising. It's not just the one thing itself that's, that's going on right now. It's important to think, you know, lots of money is coming out of the system and starting to cause a lot of pressure so last one, this is on Lincoln Financial. So as we think about what happens to the, the regional banks right now, um, this is a snapshot of the share price. This is Lincoln share price as a regional bank in the US. And so as you look at the share price kind of tick down, and then we look over here on the right hand side of this, uh, this chart here shows again, the risk to uh, insure it. So the credit default swaps. And so as you see these periods where these stocks start to fall down, it's getting more and more expensive to protect them and uh, preserve their, their capital. Um, you know, we're seeing kind of a, a steamrolling effect playing a major part in what's happening to regional banks right now. So, you know, I think this is, uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes of the financial system. Janet Yellen came out today and talked about uh, kind of their financial reserves. What are we gonna do? I think another long weekend of them trying to see what's happening as they balance kind of the, the cash reserves and the potential uh, future for some of these regional banks. So that's it for the slides today. Nice one. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> All right, good. So, um... Yeah, I mean that tells the it tells the story of kind of what's happened this week. And uh, so, why don't we skip to what do you see? What's in the crystal ball based off all this kind of pre preliminary information? What are you seeing for next week? Yeah, yeah. So the um, you know I think uh, some of the questions are what's going on in the financial system? Does this continue, or have we have we halted it or stopped it? And yeah, I think. Um, uh, Alf, uh, Macro Alf there who we follow, um, put a pretty good piece just about kind of the health of the U.S. financial system and effectively gives you a, the feeling that, you know, things are generally okay, um, but the bigger risk is starting to come now that there's, there's default risk. And so you're seeing corporations start to default on their bonds or miss payments. And, you know, we had a pretty big spike in, in corporate defaults in the U.S. Um, last month. And so we'll continue to follow that. But as rates tighten so quickly, 
things are starting to break. And so, you know, we've seen where we didn't think rates like three weeks ago, the market didn't anticipate rates being cut until next year. Now that's kind of pulled forward all the way to sometime this summer um, is where the future market's starting to price it. And so, you know, as we watch that and kind of as, as we've kind of anticipated something like this would happen, we're being patient and watching. And as our bonds are rallying through here, we're looking for the opportunity. When do we start to move and shift? And what a shift looks like in that backdrop is on the other side of this, is you see consumer discretionary accelerate, you see the financials accelerate, and you see kind of tech and growth and biotech, those types of things start to do well on the other side of this. And so, you know, from a positioning perspective, we wait and watch and prepare. Um, but uh, right now that's, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Continue to watch this extremely closely because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in flux right now. Yeah. Great. Okay. And as we mentioned uh, at the top of the show here, that uh, we continue to roll through tax season. So if anybody needs any other tax, doc, doc, talk, uh, tax documents, please let us know. Give us a call. It's even better to shoot us an email because that way you're kind of in the queue for uh, us getting you the info. Uh, it shouldn't take long. It's usually a day or two for us to turn that around. Or a lot of your tax documents are online if you have access to your, uh, your online uh, portal. And that's great. If not, not a big deal. Just give us a call or uh, send us an email and we'll get those over to you right away. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'd say, and, and bear with us, some of the accountants have asked for more information. We've been preparing that and dealing back back and forth with them as well. So certainly uh, certainly, we're, we're grinding through the list and making sure everyone's got uh, the tax packages. I'd say the last piece on that is it's not a rule for the for the institutions to send their documents uh, now, like they have until the end of March, and some of them will wait until the end of March um, before they they send their T slips. Um, so we continue to I'd say be a little bit patient. We're sending them out, and just the last piece on that too, because we you know everyone's worried about that every single slip getting every single slip. If you're dealing with an accountant when they pull down your file. Um, with your social insurance number, every single slip or tax or dividends or interest, that's going to come down with their file. They might not have the matching slip itself, but everything's going to be recorded in their systems. Even if you use the TurboTax, all that populates in there. That's a that's a good point. Yeah, because if if we have to track it down, it's uh, quite a lengthy. We got to call the we got to call the other institutions and track them down. It's quite lengthy. Um, so you're just going to be waiting. That's all. We don't mind doing it. From a customer service standpoint, but I know not everybody, a lot of you guys are kind of gathering your documents last minute. So um, certainly it's it's not required, like Ben said. Okay, uh, that's it. That's Looks it like a real sunny weekend out there. So go enjoy it, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Sounds good. Thanks. Take care.